Today we are going to take a look at Philippians chapter 1 verses 21 through 24. This is another passage which has been misinterpreted and misunderstood by the religious world in general. We want to take a close look at it, study it carefully, apply proper principles to its study, and I think that we're going to see that this passage is not saying what the majority of Christians think it says. But before we begin, we want to have a word of prayer. So let's just bow our heads reverently as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne to thank you for your holy word. And we ask that as we open your book, that we will do it reverently, with humility, with a teachable spirit. Lord, remove every preconceived notion, every obstacle that might keep us from hearing your voice. And we thank you for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Another passage that Christians frequently use in an attempt to prove that man has an immortal soul is Philippians chapter 1 verses 21 through 24. However, a careful study of these verses reveals that this type of interpretation that the religious world offers is actually eisegesis, not exegesis. Exegesis means to take out of the text what the text is saying. Eisegesis means putting our own meaning into the text. So first of all, we want to read the passage, and then we will offer a word-by-word -word study and interpretation of what the passage is teaching us. I'm reading from Philippians 1, 21 through 24. The Apostle Paul writes, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, that is this tent, if you listen to the previous presentation, if I continue living in the flesh or in this tent, in this body, this will mean fruit from my labor. In other words, because he would be doing what's pleasing to God. He, his ministry would produce fruit. Many would be converted to Jesus Christ. And then Paul continues saying, Yet what I shall choose, that is, between dying or living on in the flesh and bearing fruit, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. In other words, I'm in a difficult situation because I don't know whether it would be preferable for me to die or whether it would be preferable for me to live and to continue bearing fruit for the glory of God. Verse 23, For I am hard pressed between the two, that is, living in the tent, or dying, or being naked, according to the uh, topic that we studied previous, previously to this one. So he says in verse 23, For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. Far better than what? Far better than dying or remaining, would be departing to be with Christ. But then the Apostle Paul writes, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful to you. Now let's take a look at the historical context of this passage. Paul wrote Philippians during his first imprisonment in the city of Rome. At this point, Paul was not sure exactly what was going to happen with him. He wondered whether he would die, whether the Roman emperor would kill him and he would die as a martyr, or whether he would actually be released by the Romans so that he could continue his ministry and bear fruit to the glory of God. The very, very book of Philippians tells us that Paul was in prison at this time in Rome. Let's read Philippians 1, verse 7, and then we will read verses 13 and 14. First of all, verse 7. Here Paul writes, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, he says to the Philippians. 
inasmuch as both in my chains, so notice he is in chains at this time, in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard, so notice an indication that he's in prison, the whole palace guard, and to all the rest, that my chains, once again a reference to imprisonment, that my chains are in Christ, and most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, once again my chains, are much bolder to speak the word without fear. In other words, because Paul was in chains, and he continued proclaiming the gospel when he was in the prison, particularly to the palace guard, uh, that would be an encouragement to the Philippians to do the same wherever they lived. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. Here the Apostle Paul wrote about what his expectation and hope were. It says there, according to my earnest expectation, I want you to remember that expression, earnest expectation. It is the Greek word apokaradokia. It means eager anticipation. So he says, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. So what was Paul's eager expectation? His eager expectation was to continue proclaiming the Word of God with boldness, so that he would not be ashamed, and that he would magnify Christ, whether it be in life or whether it be in death. Now that word that I just mentioned in Greek, apokaradokia, eager anticipation, is used in another place in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul's expectation was not for his soul to leave the body to go to heaven without the body. Paul's eager expectation was to be changed or transformed at the second coming of Christ. Remember, he did not want to sleep, he did not want to be naked, two ways of saying the same thing, he did not want to die, Paul had an earnest expectation, that was that he would be transformed when Jesus comes. Notice Romans 8 verses 19 to 23. For the earnest expectation, that's the identical Greek word, apokaradokia, eager anticipation. So for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to subjected to futility, that's by the sin of Adam and Eve, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not that only, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. What was the Apostle Paul's eager expectation? Was it to die so that his soul could depart from the body and go to heaven to be with Jesus? No. When we let Paul interpret Paul, we see that his earnest expectation was, as he was alive, that he would not be ashamed because he was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that he could magnify Jesus while he was alive. But he also said that he wanted to magnify Jesus if he should die. But his eager expectation, of course, besides uh, magnifying Jesus in his body, by life or by death, 
was, according to chapter 8 of Romans and verses 19 to 23, he was eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of his body at the second coming of Christ. And all nature was actually groaning, according to the Apostle Paul, waiting for this specific glorious moment. Now, whether by life in the body or by death of the body, Paul's desire was to glorify God. He could glorify God in the body because he would preach the gospel and many souls would be converted to the truth. In what sense would Paul glorify God if the body should die? The answer is that by suffering the death of a martyr, the Apostle Paul would bring glory and honor to God because of his faithfulness. We must remember that the word martyr in Greek means witness. So the Apostle Paul says, if I should die at the hands of Rome, if the emperor commands me to die or to be beheaded, uh, like he eventually was by Nero, by the way, I can glorify God by showing my faithfulness. Let's notice a couple of other biblical examples of how martyrs glorified God by their death. John chapter 21 verses 18 and 19 describes the death of Peter. Actually, Jesus is predicting to Peter how he was going to die. John 21 verse 18 reads as follows, Most assuredly, Jesus is speaking, I say to you, when you were younger, Peter, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. That gives the indication that Peter was going to die by crucifixion. You will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And then we find an explanation of John of what Jesus meant. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. So notice here, the death of uh, Peter was going to bring glory to God. So once again, verse 19, this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. By the way, a very reliable ancient tradition says that when the Romans uh, took Peter and they were going to crucify him, they gave him one final request. They said, give us one final request. And Peter said, I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner that my master was crucified. So crucify me with my head down. In other words, he had great faith and trust in Jesus. And of course, those who were there watching, they said, man, this individual really has a lot of faith and trust in the God that he serves. Another example of a death that glorified God was the stoning of Stephen. Let's read about it in Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60. It says, And they stoned Stephen, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I love the way that the text tells us this. It doesn't say he died, although in other places of the Bible it says that people died. But here it says that Stephen fell asleep. Are you afraid of going to sleep at night? I'm not. I welcome the night when I'm able to sleep and rest. So Stephen went to sleep. It's the same thing that the Apostle Paul described as being naked, or the same thing that Paul meant when he said that a person is dead. Now, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus was due to a great degree to the constancy and serenity of Stephen when he was being stoned. Thus Stephen, by his death, saved souls. Notably, the Apostle Paul later referred to Stephen as a martyr or a witness. Notice Acts chapter 22 and verses 20 and 21. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, 
I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So here Saul of Tarsus is describing what he did when Stephen was being stoned. He was actually the ringleader of this whole thing. And he calls Stephen a martyr. By the way, do you think that Stephen in the kingdom, when he meets Saul of Tarsus, he's going to say, wow, my death was really worth it. Look, Saul of Tarsus was converted into the great apostle Paul, and thousands upon thousands will be saved in the kingdom as a result. I'm sure that Stephen will be thankful that God allowed him to be stoned so that he could give a powerful witness and many souls could be saved. Ellen White in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 101, wrote this about the impression that Stephen had on Saul of Tarsus. The martyrdom of Stephen made a deep impression upon all who witnessed it. The memory of the signet of God upon his face, his words, which touched the very souls of those who heard them, remained in the minds of the beholders and testified to the truth of that which he had proclaimed. His death was a sore trial to the church, but it resulted in the conviction of Saul, who could not efface from his memory the faith and constancy of the martyr and the glory that had rested on his countenance. And so this is a is a powerful biblical testimony that a person in death can bring glory and honor to God. So what the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, my expectation is to bring glory to God, whether it be if I remain alive and continue to bear fruit, or whether I die as a martyr, and many people, when they see that I'm faithful to the Lord, will be converted as well. Now let's go to... Uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. Here Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The Apostle Paul was not afraid of dying. What did he mean when he stated that to die is gain? Was it because he believed that when he died his soul would fly off to heaven to be with the Lord the moment that he died? Absolutely not. The Bible clearly tells us the reason why individuals say that their death would be gain. Let's notice a text where we find uh, the word rest from labors, uh, just like we found here in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. Revelation 14 verse 13. It says there, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So notice here it speaks about a group of individuals that are going to die, because it says blessed are those who die from now on in the Lord. And we're told that they rest from their labors and their works, that is the testimony of their lives, continues after they are dead. Now the important word here that links with the Apostle Paul is the word labors. The word labor in this verse does not refer simply to work. The Greek word kopos means exacting labor, trouble, toil hardship, difficult labor, exhausting labor. And very frequently when this word labor is used, it's describing evangelistic activity, the difficulty of evangelistic activity. Let's read about the Apostle Paul's labors, and we can understand why he would want to rest. He would, he would uh, if he died as a martyr, he would bring honor and glory to God, but if he died, he also would rest from the toil and from the hard work that he did while he was preaching. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 28, the labors of the Apostle Paul. Here Paul describes his ministry. Are they ministers of Christ? 
I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors, the same word of Revelation 14, 13, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths more often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, that's the same word of Revelation 14, 13, they will rest from their labors, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and then to top it all off, he says, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I dare to say that nobody has been through so many labors and trials as the Apostle Paul. So Paul is saying, if I die as a martyr, I'm going to bring glory to God, but I also am going to rest from my labors, from the hard labor that I've gone through. Paul realized that if he remained alive, he could witness to many people and see the fruit of his labors. Let's notice Philippians chapter 1 and verse 22. And let's read verse 21 for the context. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. So Paul is saying, you know, uh, I would really like to rest uh, from the toil that I've gone through in my life. He says, but if I remain alive, I can continue producing fruit for the glory of God as I preach. So he says, but if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. What did Paul mean when he referred to living in the flesh? Some people get all caught up about that. They say, we live in the flesh now, but then later we're going to be spirits or we're going to be like ghosts. That's not what Paul is saying. What is Paul saying here? Is he saying that he would not have flesh if he died? That he would be some kind of intangible spirit that would go to heaven at the moment of death? Absolutely not. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. We will have flesh when Jesus comes. It's going to be a much finer flesh. It's going to be immortal and incorruptible, but it still will be flesh but it won't be the flesh and blood that we have now. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, this tent cannot, ex uh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The body that is corruptible and mortal that we live in now cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And then the second line explains what he means. By flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now you have a parallel expression that says, nor does corruption, that's flesh and blood, the body that we have now, inherit incorruption, which is the moment that we inherit the kingdom of God. The synonymous parallelism in this verse indicates that flesh and blood refers to our present corruptible body. Incorruption refers to our future incorruptible body. The verses that come after 1 Corinthians 50, 50 and, 1, 50 and 51 make this very, very clear by stating that flesh and blood refers to corruption. It refers to our present sinful state. Let's read verses 51 to 55. Here Paul writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Remember that is a euphemism for death. We shall not all sleep, but she, we shall all be changed. When? When we die? Is that when we're changed? No. He says we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, 
then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So you'll notice here that when the Apostle Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, he's talking about the flesh and blood that we have now, that is corruptible and mortal. When he says, nor does corruption inherit in corruption, he says that this tent or this corruptible body cannot inherit the kingdom of God because we're going to have a glorified body at that time. Now when the book of Hebrews refers to the earthly life of Jesus, it refers to His earthly life as the days in His flesh or the days of His flesh, referring to His mortal body. Notice Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. Who, in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Notice that the body that Jesus had while he was on this earth is called the days of his flesh. Does that mean that when Jesus resurrected he didn't have flesh? Of course it doesn't. Jesus had flesh when he resurrected as we'll see in a few moments. What is meant by flesh and blood? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. This is going to amplify what we read from Hebrews 5 verse 7. Paul wrote, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that is Jesus, likewise shared the same. So notice, we have flesh and blood. Jesus also took the same flesh and blood. That through death, see the flesh and blood that he took was mortal because he died that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. By the way, did Jesus have flesh and bones when he resurrected? Of course he did. But it was incorruptible flesh, it was immortal flesh. It was a glorified body. You see, in the days of his flesh he had a mortal body, a weak body. In the days of his flesh his body could die, but the Bible tells us that when Jesus resurrected, He had a body, but it was a much more glorious body, immortal and incorruptible. Notice Luke 24, 39 tells us that Jesus had flesh and bones when He resurrected. He shows the disciples His hands and His feet, and He says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Did Jesus have flesh and bones when He resurrected? The Bible says yes, but they were not, uh, the flesh and bones were not the same flesh and bones that He had with His body when He was here on the earth. It's after His resurrection that His body was transformed and He was given His glorious resurrection body. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. Here we find the words of the Apostle Paul where he writes, So also in the resurrection of the dead. The body, that's the tent, folks, this corruptible tent, uh, this corruptible body that is made of clay, the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, that is the body we receive from our parents, not by a divine miracle. And it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, that's the tent by the way, and there is a spiritual body which is the building that Jesus will give us when we resurrect from the dead if we should die before Jesus comes. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 adds its testimony. It says, Therefore our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that is, transform the tent that we live in now, corruptible, mortal, 
like clay that can fall apart, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Ellen White wrote a very interesting comment about uh, this natural body and spiritual body. It's found in the book Maranatha, page 301. Paul illustrates this subject by the kernel of grain sown in the field. The planted kernel decays, like when your body goes to the grave, it decays. The planted kernel decays, but there comes forth a new kernel. In other words, the plant sprouts. The natural substance in the grain that decays is never raised as before, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased Him. A much finer material will compose the human body. That's when we resurrect. For it is a new creation, a new birth. It is sown a natural body, that is the corruptible body that we have now, the tent, it is raised a spiritual body, which is the glorified body, still a body of flesh and bones, but glorified, immortal, and incorruptible. So now let's go to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 22. The Apostle Paul writes, But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. What did Paul mean when he said that if I continue living, it will produce fruit from my labor? Well, let's read Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6. I'm going to read it from the New International Version. Colossians 1 verse 6. The Apostle Paul wrote, All over the world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. So what is the fruit? Paul says, all over the world the gospel is bearing fruit and it's growing because of the preaching of the gospel by Paul and by those whom Paul had reached. By the way, Jesus also announced that His death would bear much fruit. Notice John chapter 12 and verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. So even if the Apostle Paul died, his death would also bring forth much fruit because people would be encouraged by the fact that Paul had been faithful even unto the moment of death. So in the book of Philippians, the passage that we're studying, Paul was between a rock and a hard place where he had to make a tough choice up to this point, Paul has two options, to live in the flesh and bear fruit, or to die and of course continue producing fruit as well through his martyrdom. But now Paul is going to come up with a third possibility, with a third option. Philippians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23, Paul writes, Yet what I shall choose... I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed, he's saying I'm torn between the two. Now let's stop there for a moment. Paul is hard pressed, or Paul is uh, uh, torn between two possibilities. What are the two possibilities that Paul has presented so far? The two possibilities are either to live and continue producing fruit while he's alive by the preaching of the gospel, or suffering the death of a martyr and being a good example to other people. So he has those two possibilities, to live or to die. But now Paul says, but there's a third option that I would like more than the other two. Let's go back and read verse 22 again. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two, that is between living and dying having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. <laughs> Do you catch the point? 
He says, you know, there's something better than living or dying. And that is to depart to be with Christ. So for the Apostle Paul, there's a third option that is much better than the other two. He does not want to be left naked. He doesn't want to sleep. He doesn't really want to die. He is in prison. However, there's a third option that is far better than living in the flesh or dying. The third option is to depart and to be with Christ. And this is where Christians many times become very, very confused. They say, see, the Apostle Paul's desire was to depart to be with Christ. And this is the way that they interpret the text. And they insert words into the text that are not there. This is how they interpret the text. Paul is saying, I wish my immortal soul could depart from my body to be with Christ immediately at the moment of death. Is that what the text is really saying, folks? No, that's individuals taking what they believe that when a person dies, their soul leaves the body and goes to heaven. They're inserting that into the text. Paul is not saying, I wish my immortal soul, the word soul isn't even there, could depart from my body, that's not there either, to be with Christ immediately, that's not there either, at the very moment, that's not there either, the moment of death. So now we need to ask the question, when is it that Paul expected to be with Christ? Was when he departed at the moment of death, his soul leaving the body and going into a heavenly sphere? Absolutely not. We have to let Paul tell us when he would like to depart to be with Christ. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where we're told when the Apostle Paul expected to be with Christ. It says there in Philippians 3, verse 10, that I may know Him, that is Jesus, and the power of His resurrection. What did Paul want to know? The power of what? of the resurrection of Jesus and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Here the Apostle Paul is saying, if I die in prison, well, my glorious expectation is not to depart the body, have the soul depart the body and go to heaven. He says, no, 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 that's not it. He says, I want to know the power of Christ's resurrection and I want to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That was Paul's hope. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. This is another couple of verses that are greatly misinterpreted in the Christian world because people don't study with care. You see, they come to the Bible with a preconceived notion. They say, I know that when a person dies, their soul leaves the body and goes to heaven. So now, whenever I read a verse, I'm going to insert that concept into the Bible. But we are not to insert our ideas into the Bible, put words into the Bible. We are supposed to extract from the Bible what the Bible teaches, what the original authors or writers intended. Notice 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and 14. Here the Apostle Paul writes, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, what does even so mean? It means in the same way or in the same manner that happened with Jesus. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, that is in the same manner, in the same way, God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. And so the interpretation that is given is that uh, God the Father and Jesus are going to bring the souls of the departed saints from heaven to earth at the second coming. Is that what the text is really saying? No, that's not what the text is saying. What is the text? What is the meaning of the text? Let me interpret it for you. Paul is saying in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, that means in the same way it's going to happen with God's people. God the Father 
who by the way at the second coming he does not come to this earth he stays in heaven Jesus comes with the holy angels he doesn't come with his father his father remains in heaven just like when Jesus came to this earth his father remained in heaven when Jesus ascended his father was still in heaven when Jesus comes again with the angels the father will be in heaven now when we understand that this becomes very clear for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way God the Father will bring to heaven the movement is from this earth upward not from God the Father bringing the souls of saints from heaven down so it says even so God the Father will bring to heaven with him that is with Jesus those who sleep in Jesus so the movement is not that he's bringing the departed souls that went to heaven at death and now he's bringing them with him down to the earth that contradicts the passage the passage that we're going to read the continuation of verses 13 and 14 no the movement is not from heaven to earth the movement is from earth to heaven the father is in heaven and the father will bring to where he's at he will bring those who died along with Jesus to heaven. By the way, two Bible commentaries that are read on this point, they agree with this. The commentary by Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown on verse 14 explains it this way. The reference is not to disembodied souls. By the way, these are not Seventh-day Adventists, and they're recognizing that you can't use this text to say that departed souls are going to return to take over their bodies on earth. The reference is not to disembodied souls, but to the sleeping bodies. The facts of Christ's experience are repeated in the believers. He died and then rose, so believers shall die, then rise with Him. Albert Barnes, the great Presbyterian commentator, agreed. This is what he wrote. This does not mean that God will bring them with Him from heaven when the Savior comes, though it will be true that their spirits will descend with the Savior. <laughs> so he's not totally correct. He says, even though it's true that the spirits will descend uh, from heaven, or the souls of the departed will descend from heaven, he says that's not what the text means. So once again, this does not mean that God will bring them with him from heaven when the Savior comes, though it will be true, which we don't agree with, that their spirits will descend with the Savior. What does it mean then according to Barnes? But it means that he will bring them from their graves and will conduct them with him to glory, to be with him. The declaration, as it seems to me, is designed to teach the general truth that the redeemed are so united with Christ that they shall share the same destiny as he does. So other than the part where he says that although it's true that he's going to bring the spirits from heaven that supposedly departed when the person died, uh, which we don't agree with, he does say that verse 14 is not talking about bringing those spirits in this text. Now, let's notice then again what is being said in verses 13 and 14. I'm going to summarize it so that you understand it clearly. Jesus died, Jesus resurrected, and Jesus was caught up to the Father by a cloud of angels. What the Apostle Paul is saying is God's people are going to repeat the same sequence. God's people who die before Jesus comes, they go to the grave. When Jesus comes, they will resurrect. They will be caught up in a cloud, because the Bible says that we'll be caught up in the clouds. We're going to notice that in a moment. And then the cloud with Jesus will take the redeemed up to the Father's house. The Father will bring Jesus and the redeemed to the Father's house. Now you say, is this biblical? Of course it is. Because the text tells us that what happened with Jesus will happen with his people. Jesus died, resurrected, and was caught by a cloud to heaven. The redeemed... If they die before Jesus comes, they died, they will resurrect when Jesus comes, they will be caught up in the clouds, and they will go to heaven, to the Father's house. You say, is this a proper interpretation? Yes, the context indicates that it is. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 15 through 17. This is right after the two verses that we've taken a look at. 
It says in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, the living are not going to go to heaven before the dead. It continues in verse 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven. So notice the emphasis here is on the descent of Jesus with the angels to this earth. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Notice, now the emphasis is Jesus comes down, and the dead in Christ are going to come forth from the tomb. And what's going to happen when they come forth from the tomb? Well, they're going to be caught up in the clouds, and then they're going to be taken to the Father's house. We're going to prove that in a moment. So it says in verse 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, that is those who didn't even go through physical death, shall be caught up together with them, that is with those who died and resurrected, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. So in other words, God's people will resurrect, they will move up into the cloud, and then the clouds will take God's people to the Father's house. You say, how do we know that? Let's go to John 14, verses 1 to 3. John 14, verses 1 to 3. These are famous words that many people can repeat from memory. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, where is the Father's house, folks? We pray, Our Father which art what? Our Father which art in heaven. So the Father is in heaven. That's where His throne is. So Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go... Where did Jesus go? He went to heaven. Read Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. I go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you, my disciples. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. He doesn't say, I'm going to stay on earth with you and I'm going to establish my kingdom on earth. No, he says, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Paul's view is clear, folks. The righteous dead and the righteous living come forth from the tomb, they're caught up in the cloud, and then they're taken to the Father's house. In other words, the Apostle Paul is telling us here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that the Father in heaven will bring with Jesus those who went to sleep, those who for a while were naked, to use the terminology of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, those who died. So what is Paul's uniform perspective? In 2 Corinthians 5, he speaks of three states. Number one, alive. Number two, naked, which is the period after a person dies. Number three, translated. That's taken to heaven at the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4 expresses it a little different. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, alive, asleep, translated when Jesus comes. Philippians chapter 1 tells us, alive, dead, translated. So the Apostle Paul is not saying at all that the soul leaves the body and goes to heaven, folks. That's not what the text is saying in Philippians. It's not what the text is saying in 1 Thessalonians. Let's notice one final concept that we find in the writings of Paul. Paul wrote 2 Timothy during his second imprisonment in Rome. At this point, Paul was certain that he was going to suffer the death of a martyr. However, he was equally sure that Jesus would give him the crown uh, as a reward for his faithfulness. Now, when was God going to give him the crown? At the moment that he died? Was it a case that the Apostle Paul would be beheaded and then his soul would leave his body and he would go to heaven and then he would be given the crown? Of course not. When did Paul expect to get the crown? 
2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul wrote, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure, does it say departure to heaven? No, it's a departure from the land of the living. It's a departure from life. In other words, he's going to die. I have, so he says, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Race. I have kept the faith. In other words, I'm in Christ. I'm faithful. Finally, there is laid up for me, by the way, laid up where? In heaven, of course. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. What day? When supposedly his soul goes to heaven? No. The Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That word appearing is used consistently in the New Testament uh, to refer to the second coming of Christ. Let's read 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, that is, when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. While Paul was in prison, Paul struggled with what would be best, to live or to die, and rest from his multiple labors, from his toil and the difficulty of his ministry. Then a third option comes to mind, and that is translation without seeing death, departing to be with the Lord, not at death, but at the resurrection. He reached the conclusion that translation would be far better than the other two options. However, Paul wasn't selfish. Paul ends the passage by saying something really, really should, that should teach us a tremendous lesson. You know, Paul said, you know, to die, I would rest from my labors, and, you know, to go to heaven and be translated, that would be the best option. But now Paul says, I have to choose one of these options, and which one does he choose? Philippians 1 verse 24 ends this passage. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul is saying, you know, I'd like to be translated. If I died, I could rest from my labors, from my hard toil, but there are souls to win. And so, instead of the other two options, including the best option, which is to be translated to heaven from among the living, it is more needful for me to remain here with you. Paul was saying that as far as he was concerned, he would rather rest in the grave or go to heaven alive, but for the benefit of the Philippians, it was best for him to remain in the flesh. Because the Apostle Paul knew that if he continued traveling, if he continued going to uh, different places in the Roman Empire, multitudes would hear the gospel and accept Jesus Christ and be saved in the kingdom. So let's go once again to this passage that we find in Philippians and offer a summary and interpretation of the passage as we conclude. I'm reading from Philippians chapter 1 and verses 20 through 24. The Apostle Paul says, According to my earnest expectation, which we found to be uh, the, when Jesus comes, uh, the same expectation that all nature has, the receiving the glorified body. And so he says, According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he says, for me, living is being in Christ and preaching his gospel. 
To die would be gain because I can rest from my labors. But then he continues in verse 22, but if I live on in the flesh, in other words, if I continue living in this tent, this will mean fruit from my labor. In other words, if I continue living in this body, then I will continue to preach the gospel, and as a result, my ministry will have a lot of fruit. And so then Paul says, once again, verse 22, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Up to this point, he's presented two options. He says to live or to die. So he says, for I am hard pressed. Verse 23, I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart to be with Christ. Now comes a third option into view. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Far better than what, folks? Far better than one of the two other options. Far better than staying and preaching the gospel and going through all the toil and labor and difficulties and opposition. Far better than, uh, than him uh, actually uh, dying which he, nobody really wants to die, the other option is to be translated to heaven from among the living. So he says, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, by the way, far better than the other two options. And then Paul ends by saying, I'm going to make a choice which is not the best choice uh, for me personally, but I need to think about the kingdom of Christ, not about my own comforts and my own desires. He ends by saying, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Now the interesting thing is that the Apostle Paul undoubtedly has won more souls after he died than while he was alive. Because how many thousands probably millions of individuals have read his letters. And as a result of reading his letters, they have embraced Jesus Christ as Savior. They've accepted the gospel and they are in Christ. And when Jesus comes, they will resurrect to be with Jesus forevermore. So we've studied these verses from the book of Philippians and we find no evidence that Paul's desire was for his soul to depart the body to be with Christ. In the New Testament, the hope of the Christian is always the resurrection of the dead, not the immortality of the soul. All Christians have looked to the glorious day of the resurrection. And so, as we've studied this passage, let us understand that the hope of the Christian is in the resurrection, not in the immortality of the soul. 